Welcome to the Gluck Solution Podcast. I am Dr. Eric Gluck, executive life coach, clinical hypnotist, and master problem solver. We're here with Tom Avitable, writer, producer, director, Manhattan ad executive, and published author. A modern-day Renaissance man, Tom is a master self-starter, a fierce intellect, and he's perpetually curious. With the motto, it's only fiction until it happens. Tom's books, The Eighth Day and The Hammer of God, have garnered critical acclaim from readers and respect from the intelligence community. Tom, it's a pleasure. Welcome. I'm so curious to meet this guy. <laughs> he sounds Look pretty in good. the mirror, Tom. Look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, I did that this morning. He needed a shave. <laughs> yeah. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, the thing is, whenever somebody uh, holds that mirror up to you, uh, I think you're on the good side of life when you say, "Man, was that me?" <laughs> I just when you just put that all together, it was like, "Wow, I, I don't get paid enough." You know what? I'm going to actually start with something that I know about you. I know a lot about you, but you made your own computer at the age of 14. 14, and you were pounding the pavement to show people what you created. It's obviously that you've been a self-starter since you're a child. Um, tell us about do-it-yourself ethics. You know, it's. I wasn't conscious of it. It's um, it's about the vision, and uh, my primary uh, motivation was to build a computer in an attaché case. Why? Because that was the days of Man from Uncle, and uh, from Russia with Love, where he had the knife and the exploding talcum powder in the attaché case, and uh, the I, the computer as it was uh, it was in a popular electronics book, and it wasn't really a computer. It was actually a, a, bin a, dig a decimal to binary converter, but it's the heart of any computer. So you, you know, you rotary dial, dial in a 10, and it goes tick, 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 and it comes out one light on, one light off, one light on, one light off, which in, everybody knows in binary is one eight, no fours, one two, no ones, eight and two is 10. So it was binary. Um, but it was enough. It was enough to say you're in the digital age. And, uh, the original design was in something called a uh, project box, which looked like a you know old piece of clunky stuff from like a, a, a monster movie from the fifties. I decided to build it in a attaché case because that was the cool thing at the moment. So it was really the vision of a computer in an attaché case. <laughs> it's as stupid as that sounds. With that attaché case, though, I was able to get on the subway and go downtown. And why did I go downtown? Um, I had uh, this suspicion that I could sell this to somebody, that somebody would actually want to buy this thing. You know, now it's 1968, I'm 14 years old, right? And it's like somebody wants to buy a computer and have the shake case, and they must be downtown, they must be in those big buildings where all the people who do things are. So I'd go down the buildings, I'd press all the buttons on the elevator. And when the door opened, on the elevator, of course, I piss everybody off. <laughs> you know, I was this kid. In those days, you know, we didn't have security and everything. You walk in any building, so I push all the buttons. And when the door opened, I go, <laughs> I'd be sniffing. Why? Because uh, I had actually had one experience in a computer room, uh, quite by accident, at Fordham University, and they had uh, there was a smell. And I didn't know what that smell was at the time. I later learned that the smell was acetate. If you know vinegar, vinegar and acetate smell alike. Acetate was the base that they used on magnetic tape, which is part of the drives of the computer, and it permeated the floor. Wherever the computer was, it smelled like vinegar. So when the doors open and it smelled like vinegar, I'd step out, wander around, see a door that says authorized personnel only, bl blast through, get out of here. I built a computer. What? Click, click, open the case. I was their little darling, and this is what happened. They'd start giving me stuff, computer parts, manuals, books, jobs. They'd hire me, and they, they'd say, here, uh, do this. And they'd give me little, you know, stupid now, jobs. I want everyone out there to remember, he's 14 when he's doing this. 14 years old. So I, I want you to tell me about your life as a Washington insider and then your transition into being an author. Well, insider is maybe a little strong. I was uh, a consultant to the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Um, and as a con what that meant was I brought a skill set to the, what the committee needed at that moment in time. What the committee needed to do at that moment in time was sell big science. And uh, they had had some success selling uh, a super collider project uh, 
with a video. And uh, they next wanted to focus on high-definition television and all the ramifications of high-definition. And I was brought in through Bell Labs out of New Jersey to work with the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology and a group of other people. It wasn't just me. It was a whole, a whole group. And our job was principally to explain to a bunch of lawyers, which is what Congress is, uh, why this uh, idea of having high-definition television and by extension, broader bandwidth and something called the intranets, and then by extension, something called spectrum and cell phones and the ability to have 256K switching and all this stuff that falls in with it was a good idea for America and that they shouldn't go with the Japanese standard because the Japanese standard was being considered at that moment, which meant that uh, we would have been kind of uh, saddled with an old form of high def. I know that sounds strange, but there was an old form of high def. Right. Um, and uh, it was stolen from the bench in 1975 from MIT, brought to Japan, and then they worked on it. Meanwhile, MIT went further. So by the mid-90s, when, when I got to play on this stage, uh, there was digital television. If you need to know what that is, watch a movie on your iPhone. That right. wouldn't have happened with the Japanese standard. You seem, to, you seem to, have to always be ahead of the curve. Now, we, we have similar models. My motto is to, there's a, to every problem there is a solution. My belief is that there's no such thing as a problem that can't be solved. Now, your motto is creative solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. So explain what exactly does that mean, creative solutions to problems. What, why is that your motto? Well, it's, it's actually a, a, a vocational mo model in that I, I truly mean creative in the advertising world, Don Draper world, sense of creative. Um, my task, whether it was uh, OSHA compliance, House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology explaining complicated science to, to lawyers, um, or convincing someone why they have to buy a dog food, you know, for their dog, um, that's a, a, a problem or challenge that a marketer or somebody who has a message needs to get out. So when I say creative solution, uh, I come up with the, um, with the way it looks, smells, feels, and, um, and relates to people. And that is the solution that gets them over whatever sales figure, whatever sales uh, you know, goal they have. That's the vocational aspect of it. But as you go wider into life, um, most people are conditioned response, you know, stimulus response. Creativity, even in life, sometimes breaks people's patterns. And, and it's, it's good to do that. It's good to go creative uh, sometimes to break people's patterns. And you find you dig, uh, you dig deeper with that type of shovel than with a pickaxe and a, and a, and a front-on kind of approach. And you start people thinking in a different me methodology or a different modality, and all of a sudden new things come up because it's creative is part of art, and art is part of seeing the world from a different perspective. Hmm. That's, why we, that's why we love art. It shows us the common everyday place in a, in a new angle, a new perspective. So taking that same kind of guidance and applying it to whether it's a marketing problem, a personal problem, a... Uh, uh, an energy problem, or even a computer problem, uh, or, or electronics. I mean, my training was in electronic engineering. And uh, the same problems that you overcome, or that have been overcome by creative ingenuity and innovation, that same blueprint, I think, applies everywhere. Now, it's interesting, Tom. That was your beginning. You're mm -hmm. obviously a self-starter, but you've done so many things, which is why I've called you a renaissance man. Mm -hmm. Author, musician, woodworker, advertiser, producer, director. Um, do you get bored? One. And <laughs> is there, are you, are you a jack of all trades or a master of all trades? Do, how do you immerse yourself into what you're doing and actually make it who you are at that moment? I may be a master of one trade, and that's uh, that one trade that I'm a master of has application in a whole series of things that come to me, but it's always the same methodology. So what is that, what is that trade that you are the master of? Analysis, 
the ability to see things uh, and see potential connections. Like I saw the computer in an attaché case. Like I, I, I see a commercial. And my first experience was I was living in Queens with my first, uh, my first relationship. And uh, I'm standing in the living room and I'm acting out an idea I have for a commercial. And she looked at me and she said, well, that sounds nice. Two weeks later, we sat in that same living room and watched it on TV. And that complete cycle from vision to, in this case, the reality, the reality being a commercial or the vision of the computer to the actual physical computer and, and on and on and on. It's the vision that drives you. Mm -hmm. And then everything else along the way becomes the tools that you pick up or the reason why you need to know that. So uh, we were talking earlier about technology and uh, I started out in film very early. I made my first film when I was 12, it was eight millimeter. At 14, I made my first 16 millimeter movie, which is actually a thesis for my English teacher. And uh, I just dug right in, I loved it. But it was, when it came to editing, um, I figured out a way to do it with seven tape recorders and a mixer and a whole bit. And I was doing live mixes while we were running the silent picture and I was pressing the buttons on cue and everything. Well, what I was doing, I eventually wound up doing for real as a film sound mixer in New York with hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars worth of equipment. I did it with everything in the AV closet in junior high school, but the, the vision was the same. I want the sound to be continuous, and I want this noise to come in when I want it to come in, so I learned about cueing the tape. And then cueing the tape led me to editing the tape. Editing the tape led me to video editing. Video editing led me to uh, Avid. Avid led me to opening the first digital uh, computer uh, outpost in the Hamptons, which led me to the whole world of Hollywood because suddenly Alec Baldwin didn't have to go out to California to do ADR for a movie. He'd come in in his shorts and sit in my studio, and I'd hook him up to California, and he'd sit there, and his kid was running around outside. He did his obligation, never had to leave town. Now, this is why we call you the Renaissance man. So, so it was Einstein, the same thing. It was a vision. Einstein said curiosity is much more important than intelligence. So, Tom... Is there a correlation between intelligence and success, or is there a different formula? Tell me what the secret of the sauce is. Uh, intelligence is a hard word. It really is. Uh, for, uh, the, my classic loving favorite is Henry Ford, who was, uh, when they wanted to take over the company, they tried to kick him out. And they kicked him out on the basis that he wasn't an educated man. They never went to college. And now, you know, all the suits were in, and they wanted Ford. And even though he built the company and even though he came up with the whole idea, his time had passed and they wanted to get their hands on the company. So it came down to a big court trial. And the judge sat there and said, uh, Mr. Ford, you've been called an educated man. He says, that's true, Your Honor. Right? I didn't have formal education. He says, well, how do, you, how do you expect to run this company in the new world? And he says, Your Honor, on my desk I have five buttons. One is marked economy, one is marked history, one is marked politics. One, you know. He says, when I have a question, I just push the button and I get the number one expert in the world in my office in five seconds. And he went, you got the company. So is that intelligence or is that, is that a kind of application because he, was, he had to be curious? So what yeah. that was, Tom, I, is again, it was what I feel it takes to succeed is emotional intelligence. Ooh, emotional, I like that. Emotional intelligence is to know exactly what your strengths are and to know what they're not and then actually to find the best of the best and to utilize them. Which is why on your list of all the things I am, as I was saying before, there's not oil painting. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I really stink at that. Or house painting, which I also know I stink at. Uh, so, yeah. So the but reason he, why that's he, not on my he, resume he, is because that's not what I do. But I'm going to tell you why you stink <laughs> at it. See, you want to know? You never knew. You went to shrink Wait, for 30 I, years. Are we back at this? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. <laughs> yeah. if, if anyone out there never wants to work, ever, then what you do is you find something you truly love and have passion for. Hmm. And and you find out how to make money doing it, and you don't have to work. You know, you aren't good at something when you don't love it. Hmm. When you love something, you actually immerse yourself in. You have creative solutions. So, what is what is your next evolution? What's the next thing you're going to be doing? Wow, I have no idea until it comes. Um, and, and why do you, tell me this. I'm going to ask this with a different question. Why do you think people fail at things they attempt? Ah. 
I'm going to say something that sounds self-referential and kind of stupid and obvious. Successful people don't fail. Now, that might sound chauvinistic. No, it does. You know what? But here's what I mean. Okay, good. I'm glad. If you're on a success arc and you fail, you recycle that failure. You blend it in. You do what Edison said. I, you know, I didn't fail making a light bulb. I, f- I discovered 1,121 ways how to not make a light bulb. But in the seeds of that failure, or, or I should say in that failure, are the seeds of success. And it, the successful, I guess, uh, uh, envelope is that you, you recycle, you, bring, you fold it back in, and you use that as part of the next attempt. So you only really fail when you make failure stop you. If, you. if you're trying to do something and you don't fail, you're probably not doing the right thing because there are very few things that are immediately apparent, things that are worth it that are immediately apparent. So you are going to stumble. You are going to go down wrong roads. You're going to have to backtrack. You're going to have to decide um, not only that it didn't work, but I think the successful person takes the fact that it didn't work, figures out what not to do again, and then hits it again and tries again. And eventually through that paring down process, whether that's a millisecond or a thousand years, through that paring down process, you get to success. So I say successful people don't fail. They recycle Right, so, so what I'm hearing you say, I'm going to put it in my words and tell me if this sounds right. Mm-hmm. I'm hearing you say that the ladder to success, the steps are failure. And every failure brings you closer and closer and closer to that success. And that there is no success unless there's failure. So failure should be embraced as progress as opposed to something negative. And, and failure is how you view it. You know, to, to turn around and say... Oh, man, I failed. I, went, I started out to do X. You know, I started out to make a better, uh, a better paint, and I, and I wound up making white out. Right. You know? But or, is, 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 there, is there a time when people should just say, you know what, I quit? Yeah, as soon as they think they should quit, they should quit. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. It goes back to the vision thing. In other words, if there's a burning vision somewhere in front of you that has to be fulfilled, then quitting is not an option. You can intellectually find out at some level that your vision doesn't work. That's different. Because if your vision doesn't work, again, according to the successful people doesn't fail rule, there's something in that vision that will take you to the next level. But if you abandon that, you're never going to get anywhere in that, in that direction. And if you if that's your, your modality of the constantly you know, trying and moving back, you're just going to be a whole bunch of false starts. You're never going to get anywhere that you consider satisfactory. Tom, I couldn't really agree with you more. There's a verse in, in the scripture that says, without a vision, the people perish. Once you stop seeing and believing, then you've run out of gas. Right. So it's, it's really that seeing and believing. Uh, Another question. You frequently draw on principles from science and apply them to humanity. For example, resistance in science, how we should embrace resistance to motivate others. Can you explain what you mean? There is absolutely no difference between something that doesn't work and something that works at 100% efficiency to the outside world. Here's what I mean. Perpetual motion. We all played with it as kids. In a perfect idea of what perpetual motion is, nothing is done. Why? Because perpetual motion means that there's no resistance. So therefore, something can go on doing something forever. Right. Like those balls that hit one another and keep on going back and forth. But they eventually uh, secede to to the uh, inertia or the the lack of uh, reinforcement of energy. Perpetual motion would be you click the ball in 21 B.C., and it's still going at the same rate, at the same pulse today. The problem with that is that as soon as you get trying to get that ball to do something, you're adding resistance, and it stops. And the reason why everything stops is resistance. But I want to roll back one step. In electronics, in electricity, you have voltage, you have amperage, and you have resistance. Okay, Voltage is the push. Amperage is what you're pushing, the actual electricity itself. And resistance is what you're trying to push it through. 
If you don't have resistance in a circuit, resistance meaning a light bulb or a toaster or a radio or anything that does work, then you look at the circuit, you don't know if it's on or off, do you? The light bulb's not lit <laughs> or there's no light bulb, so you don't know if it's on or off. So that could be said to be perfect because there's no resistance. It's either running at 100% efficiency or zero because there's no way to tell. But as soon as you put a resistor like a light bulb or, a, 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 again, a toaster in the circuit, there's resistance and work starts being done. There is no work without resistance. For example, if you're riding on a frozen lake in a car and you hit the gas, the car's not going anywhere because yeah. there's no resistance for the tires to grab onto and get yeah. traction. You know what? Where this comes into application in real life is that I have found in my, in my practice for over 30 years that children who are born into a family, very wealthy family, and have everything done for them, mm -hmm. they in fact are usually the most miserable and least successful people because they have the least resistance. Mm -hmm. And very often those who are born with you know, the, normal, uh, the normal abnormal conflicts of life use the resistance as a way to, to perpetuate, to learn, you know, to find out what, what works and what doesn't work. So that actually makes a good deal of, of sense. And, and if I can just further, the, it's also about how you're taught, taught it. In other words, I'm, I'm making the statement right now that resistance is universal, that everything from a flower punching through the ground to a plane flying in the air to a planet going against solar winds experiences resistance. Now, if, you're the, if your personality takes resistance as personal, it's against me, and you become a victim of resistance, you're not going anywhere. But if you understand that you were born into an environment where resistance is a good thing, when resistance comes to you, you embrace it. And if resistance causes you to think you're failing, you realize, no, this is the state of human existence. This is a state of physical existence and science existence. It's not personal. I can get beyond this. Tom, what you're saying is so important. I'm, I'm going to put it in in my words, and I want you to tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. I always tell everyone that all rejection is self-rejection. There is no rejection unless you're rejecting yourself. That if you use resistance in life, what everyone says, as a means of learning or a means of dismissing, then you could continue to move on. Where Where people actually find themselves stuck is when they have such a fear of interpreting that resistance as that's who they are and they can't get past it, that's usually when they become very l less productive. So, so you and I have just given them a pass by saying resistance is everywhere. It's part of our existence. It's not personal. It's what you need to have in order to do work. Correct. It's never personal. Never you know, and, and it's the same principle when people come in with their secret problems and they shut the door and they say, this is in confidence. No one has this. And I tell them, yeah, everyone has this. Okay. <laughs> no one has anxiety. You're right. Everyone has anxiety. Okay. You know, now accept that and let's see how we're going to identify the resistance in your anxiety and then overcome it. Yep. So I want to... I think we solved that. Thing. We solved yeah. that. Yeah, the world's problems. That's what we do here. <laughs> so the hammer of God. Okay, the hammer of God and the eighth day are hot stopping thrillers. Everyone actually out there, go out and buy it. It's dealing with Bill Hickok, who along with his team, stop terrorists who have America in their crosshairs. Now, Tom, the issue of torture is in this book. And I, I want to talk to you about the torture. conditionality... Torture the morality, the ethics. When, Tom, is it okay to torture someone? Example, there's a bomb on a plane that would kill one million people. There's a terrorist who has the key to decoding it. Is it okay to torture that person? Or would you kill a baby if the antibody in that child would save a billion people from dying from a disease? Tell me what you think, Tom. I think, I think dilemmas and ethical dilemmas should be taught in school. And I think uh, this way, when these situations actually come up, it's not the first time you've heard it. The baby thing is a tough one. But if you, if you talk about the, the ticking bomb, which means it's someone's action, someone made a choice to kill, it's a little easier. When you talk about the baby, it's an innocent. 
So that, that gets emotionally complex. Unfortunately, the answer is the same. The, the, the needs of the many, okay, have to be taken into consideration. And it's a tough one. But I just want to take a step back. The, in my first book, it's exactly that. There's a, 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 a guy on the ground and there's a female FBI agent. And her partner has just run out to defuse a bomb or think what he thinks is a bomb. And she's got to know when it's going to go off. And she perforates the man's leg with a thirty-eight caliber in the leg. And then she takes the gun and puts it somewhere more private and says, the next one. And, of course, he blabs. She gets written up as a little citation. She's now the star of the third book. Okay. So – was that justifiable? Yeah, because they were about to blow up the gas tanks in Jersey and send chlorine gas all over the New York area and kill 16 million people. Did she kill him? No. She perforated his leg in the fleshy part. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't like he's going to leave and limp. But the threat was imminent. You know, the personal threat to him was imminent. In the second book, there is no torture. And it's interesting, it's interesting that, the, that it's seen that way. It's a theater. What, what I have in the second book is psychops. So in, what happens is the, um, the captured terrorist is um, playing the game that uh, the rules, as he understands them by us, the quote-unquote good guys, means that uh, he's going to get his meals, he's going to get his uh, religious allowance, he's going to be able to do anything he wants to do because uh, he's, got this, he's got our system working for him. They take away all those rules. That's all they do. They make him feel suddenly that he's not under the protection of the United States Constitution. So is that terrorism? No, it's, it's actually a staged play. And, and the, guy, the lead guy for the FBI is a theater major out of Princeton. And they're play acting. And the whole thing is nothing more than an episode of 24, essentially, in terms of everybody's acting a role, everybody's playing a different role, and, but he's believing it. He's buying into it. And once he's convinced that he does not have the Constitution to protect him, he starts to open up because he realizes that these guys are playing in the same uh, rough game that they play on his side of the, of, of the court where, you know, you can behead people and you can, uh, you know, uh, do all kinds of you know, horrible things to people because you, you're not playing by those rules. So we just take away the safety net. He's never in danger. He's never threatened. It's purely all for show. And at the end, when he realizes all this, I mean, maybe he's then tortured in his brain that he gave up all, you know, the serious information. Don't about tell it. too much of the book. I want them to buy it, Tom. Well, yeah, but I mean, torture is a serious I wanna, charge. I want to br <laughs> I, I bring up something about torture. Yeah. It, when, when I just made that question, I posed that question to you. Mm. Um, the listeners out there, most of them, my guess is everyone is saying, absolutely, I will absolutely blow up the plane. I would kill that, torture that terrorist to make sure that people in the plane are safe or a bomb is not delivered. Mm -hmm. And I would absolutely kill that baby if it meant a billion babies, mm -hmm. except if it was mine. Yeah. Well, that's, so, so, yeah of course. so the situational ethics, what people actually experience is not the ethics of what is right and wrong intellectually, but emotionally, there's a difference between intellectual ethics and emotional ethics. Which is why they invented recru recrusal, recl reclusal. <laughs> Sorry, it's early in the morning. Reclusal. Uh, that's why a judge recludes himself from, a, from a, a case that he may have resonance to because it's different when it's yours. Correct. So anyone out there who wants to actually debate the ethics, you have to remove yourself from the equation. Yes. The question is, does society, does the world actually advance for the common good and that often, often people, often steps need to be taken that appear to be immoral, but in fact, the, the person who is doing the interrogation is not looking to create pain and suffering but rather is looking to prevent pain and suffering from uh, hundreds and thousands and millions of people. Yeah, let me give you, let me no, give but you. I wanted to describe, oh, no, no, give me, give me, I'm no, cutting I, you I, off. Here's, here's how I cover it. Um, as an author writing books that are available at Barnes and Noble and uh, Amazon, <laughs> by the way. Um, and I just wrote a blog on this. Uh, to me, good and evil from my world is defined in the following. 
Good, selfless. Evil, selfish. So, get back to the baby. If killing the baby is a selfless act, selfless, it, it goes to good. If killing a baby is a selfish act, it's bad. I know that sounds utterly simplistic, but I believe the entire range of human experience come, falls between selfless and selfish. I believe every criminal is selfish. I believe most addictions are selfish. I believe that uh, good deeds and heroes are selfless. So it goes to intent, but it's, it's a very easy spectrum that's very clear. Now, if the father has to kill the baby and he does it for the good of all, would you say that's a selfless act? Uh, I would. Absolutely selfless. (laughs) But if the father kills the baby because he wants to continue getting the checks or he wants to get even at the wife, that's selfish. And I think that's where the human range comes down. I mean, these these are horrible, horrible things to deal with. But to me, that's what defines my characters. So when uh, in the in the first book the, uh, the 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 major is flying at, at Mach one towards Manhattan because there's a plane off the radar and everybody's afraid it's going to be another nine eleven and in that moment he's calculating in his head creating the small tragedy to avoid the larger tragedy killing two three hundred people in a plane and to stop thousands or maybe millions because we don't know what the nature of the threat is from dying on the ground that's a crap job to be in. Okay, and he's the pointy end of the stick, and he's the one that's got to pull the trigger. But he's got to look at the. He's not. If he pulls the trigger because he wants to be the hero that saved New York, that's bad. That's selfish. If he pulls the trigger because he's saving the people on the ground, that's selfless. And the pain and the nightmare, and the fact that he's never going to be able to sleep for the rest of his life, the crummy mathematics of that, that he knows is going to follow, not the fame, not the glory. But the, the sleepless nights, the, the and almost guaranteed alcoholism that's going to happen after you kill 300 innocent people to save millions, that's his price. And if he selflessly makes that decision, he's a hero. If he does it because he wants fame and glory, he's a dog. So in that cockpit when he's flying and he's doing this mathematical uh, calculation in his head, his only thought is, God Please let them be over water because that is even less damage because the plane will go into the water as opposed to now you have a plane flying out of control over the city. So you're creating a, a minier, minier tragedy than whatever their goal was, you know, hit a nuclear plant or whatever would really amplify their effort. And that's his only thought at that point. He makes it very simple. I just hope they're over water. And no. that's how he survives the situation. It's interesting how you use the word simple. The most brilliant person who can take a complex situation and make it sound very simple. So I think that simple comes really out of your genius. But I'm going to add a twist. Now, I divide the world into two types of people. I divide them into hedonists and moral hedonists. Mm -hmm. Hedonists are people who simply live their life for pleasure. It's all about them. Moral hedonists live their life for pleasure that actually gives other people pleasure as well, but they still derive pleasure from it. So is Mother Teresa selfish or selfless? She is a moral hedonist. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I like like your paradigm because you can have the duality of both can exist. And and, and when I go through my selfless, selfish range, the question is, does Mother Teresa do it because the devotion to God and that little tingle that you get when you're doing something right is her selfish you know, ambition to feel that again. Is she high on good? And does that make her selfish? I mean, you can go crazy with this. But no, because, because, <laughs> because the reptilian brain, that, that part of that primal part of the brain, that 200 million year old part of the brain that's simply like a computer, which is 0001, right. it gravitates towards pleasure, it avoids pain. So Mother Teresa still is getting pleasure from what she's doing. So she's just a uh, selfish person. <laughs> no, she is just a moral hedonist. <laughs> I love it. No, I, again, I love the, the fact that moral hedonism allows for the duality of, of, of the contradiction. I think that's great. I really do. 
<laughs> so let me ask you a question. Do you think there are any similarities between what actually goes on in government and what happens in your book? Um, yeah, big time. Um, well, you know, the quote on my book is uh, from a high place government official who says, uh, frighteningly realistic. Washington had better read this one, you know. So, um, yes, and I'll give you a prime example. Uh, on August, uh, August of two, uh, 2000. Uh, one, I was uh, at a conference on terrorism, and I went up to the lead FBI guy who had just uh, finished the, doing the investigation of the bombing of the coal. And um, you shot him in the leg. No, I did not shoot him <laughs> in the leg. That was not me. That was my associate. No. So I walk up to him and I say, listen, I'm writing a book and it's about terrorism and I don't want it to ever be a how-to book to a terrorist. So I'm going to run some scenarios by you and you tell me if I can print them or not. I went scenario number one. He said, no problem. Scenario number two. He said, no problem. Scenario number three. He says, ah, you're on safe ground. I thanked him very much, shook his hand. Two weeks later, he quit his job at the FBI. Then that following Monday, he started his new job. On that Tuesday, he died in that job in scenario number three which was a plane crashing into a building. He was now the head of security of the World Trade Center, last seen running back into the tower. Two, uh, four weeks before he died in, in uh, the World Trade Center, I had said to him, I have a plane crashing into the Empire State Building. Is that going to give anybody ideas? He said, no, you're on safe ground. You no, know, it's interesting that there is no safe ground. You know, what you do is you create, you've always seen the future. You built a computer at 14 years old. Um, terrorism. Well, I, I believe what he means is the ideas are already out there. Oh, there, there are and ideas here's, here's already how out I know there. that. Okay. In June of that year, the G8 summit in Genoa, Italy, the Secret Service closed Italian airspace and used the term ground stop before we knew what a ground stop was uh, because Egyptian intelligence out of Hamburg had come up with a plot to hijack a civilian airliner and crash it into the G8 summit and kill President Bush and all the other leaders of the country. So the Secret Service ordered a ground stop in Italy during the G8 summit. Somehow or another, that information never got to the FAA, believe it or not, never got to the FBI, believe it or not, never got outside the Secret Service. So that when these guys hit the cockpit, there was no advance warning, although in June, that was the fear that they were going to hijack a plane. So what he was saying to me was, no, the information's already out there. You're not going to give anybody an idea they don't already have because they've already tried that. Now, this again, this is August, so he knows about the June thing, you know. So that's what he meant. But... Again, this goes back to the wall between the, you know, inter-rivalry. Of, well, of so this is the point. Every idea obviously is not out there because all the time we're evolving with new ideas. That's what we do day to day. Right. Do you ever become afraid that your work could actually inspire terrorists and give them some new ideas? Well, again, that was the reason for the conversation with him. And I felt very good about that. Um, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why I don't think so. Um, in my book, I changed the formulas of things. Uh, for example, book, book two, it talks about something called the Jesus factor. Um, I live most of my life uh, ready to get shot in the head because I, th I had heard about the Jesus factor. And uh, what, what is the Jesus factor? Um, it's the, the science uh, regulating whether or not you can have a nuclear war. And in that simple statement is there could be a point where the United States, you could not make a detonation in the United States, but Russia would be vulnerable. So the time to strike is then because you launch, you destroy them, their missiles that come back can't explode because of a scientific anomaly. And this was charted out of 166 nuclear tests that didn't work. And the reason why they didn't work was some sort of celestial mechanics that was discovered by an independent researcher. Um, so that became the Jesus factor. And I lived in a lot of fear of knowing this uh, because if you just got on television and said in the public, there is days, there are days when you can't have a nuclear war. Now the Russians may know that there are days you can't have a nuclear war, but don't know we know. Really, I'm serious about this. They know and, now, Tom. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, see now, you, that's exactly it. But... I didn't write the book until I sat with President Clinton. He was very gracious. He gave me 10 minutes of his time, which, think about it, 10 minutes, you know. Um, and I said to him, sir, when, but did anybody ever come to you and say there are days you can't have a nuclear war? And I'm asking you because 
I'm going to write something about that. And I want to make sure that he says, no, 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 no one's ever said that to me. You know, we went on and we went on to have a 10 minute discussion on thermonuclear war and the, the, um, I mean, some fascinating stuff, but he basically said, because he, the, the theory of the Jesus factor is it's not written down. It's verbally handed to every president by a, one guy. You know, and there's a whole system, and people in the system don't know what they're doing. Like there's a tracking system that constantly measures the exact distance to the sun that the Earth is, but they don't know why they're doing that. There's a communication system that goes back to 1966 uh, that uh, is still in place. Nobody knows why. It's all this ch chain of command that was set up when the Jesus Factor was discovered. So that if, if there's and today it means something. I mean, there's still 19 strategic rocket divisions in the USSR, and we still have silos. Nothing has changed. We have less birds, but we have more multiple reentry vehicles on every bird. So the uh, nuclear sword of Damocles has never left us. It's just left the front page. So this is as valid today. So if, if the Jesus Factor was truly in operation, and I'm spoiler alert in my book, but if it was truly in operation, I would... A, I wouldn't have written it, and B, if I got a bullet in the head, again, to save billions, that would be okay right. if I wasn't supposed to know it. Because you have moral hedonism. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. I want to go to club. What would that so, so Tom, club for, for those out there right now who are reaching for a drink or taking a diet, <laughs> Um, let me let me say this. Who need therapy? Who need therapy? Yeah. <laughs> That's the real reason for this, yeah, isn't it? Of course. <laughs> let me just say this: that what what we really want to do is we want you to think, and then we want you to say that time and life is so precious. Live, you know, enjoy these. Be a participant in the solution to these problems, but live your life because life is short anyway. You're going to die anyway. When and how is really immaterial. Focus on living. Now, that leads me into the next question. Ooh. This book is script ready. Yeah. Okay. What efforts have you gone through to make this into a script? And who would you want to play your major character? What actor out there would, would, would actually be Hitchcock or any of the other major characters? When I wrote my first book, The Eighth Day, right? Available at Barnes and Noble. And, you know, <laughs> when I wrote my first book, The Eighth Day, um, before. It got to the shelf. It got to George Clooney. Really? So the story goes. He reads it and tells the powers that be, make a good movie. Thank you very much. He didn't say it's starring or anything. He just said, make a good movie. It was his opinion. He did, read it for a friend. They immediately optioned the film rights. The book hadn't been on the shelf yet, and we sold the film rights. So the film rights are optioned? They were. No, they were. Okay. They were. Um, and they, it's, all, it's reverted back to me. Um, so... That was the first step. What they didn't know at that time was that the book came from a script. I'd written a screenplay. I still have it. It's called Brain With. Okay. And it was a, exactly the core story that is the book. But, you know, a, a, a screenplay is maybe 40 pages of a book, if you, you know, word count. So if you've got a 400 page book, you, how do you pull a tenth of that out once you have a book and you have to go back and find the underlying core? Well, this was the core. This was the outline by which I wrote the book, but it was already a screenplay. In fact, I took the screenplay and dumped it into Word and just started putting meat on the bones. But So I had that. And, and the, the, the chairman of the board of the company that uh, wanted me to put this out to Hollywood, when he called me, he said, uh, what do we do? Do we send him a script or do we send him a book? And I said, listen, don't send him a script. So why? I said, they know how to judge a script. They can look at the margins. It gives them a reason to say no. Send them the book. Because in the book, they'll see a movie, and then they'll be the genius. Right. And it works. So the best thing you can do is send the book out to someone who has a vision, a vision. And let them find the vision in the book, and then they become an advocate. If you send them a script, you've already made certain choices. You've already pruned. You've already decided no petunias but you know, irises. And they say, you know, I never liked irises. But when you send them the garden, they get to pick their own bouquet. The bouquet they pick is the bouquet they'll love. I made the garden. If I decide what the bouquet is, I'm limiting myself. So send the, send the garden, send the book, let them figure it out. That's the little key there. Because a script, 
How dare you write a script? We are the script people. See, normally, <laughs> normally I am simply a nonfiction person, but I love your expression. It, it's only fiction until it happens. So I would actually strongly encourage everyone to read this book because maybe it's fiction, maybe it's not. Makes a great Father's Day gift. So let me ask you a question. There are, in New York City, we have thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of unemployed, aspiring actors, directors, um, what would you do to prepare a person, whether they want to be an actor, director, producer, uh, to the rejections that they're going to face? And what would you say to them? What should they, what should they be thinking in order to prepare themselves from entering into this industry? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, if they knew, if they knew, how hard it was, half of them would make a left into something else. It seems easy. It seems, wow, it must be great to stand and go, and action, and cut, and that's it. It's not. The homework I have to do, even for a 30-second commercial, okay, is three or four days for 30 seconds. And for a 120-page script or 110-page script, you could be six months in deep, deep prep. Every question, every decision. When you're the director, you're not the boss. You're everyone's assistant. And you don't direct just talent. You direct in a 360-degree sphere around the camera. You are directing the third electric as much as you're directing the $2 million star in front of you. Because that third electric can blow a lunch call on you. But if you treat them right, if you walk over and you say, hey, it's a nice rig you did there with the trombone hanging off of the way to wire. And the guy goes, hey, thanks. Somebody pay attention to what I'm doing. Well, you're damn right I am because you're giving me backlight. But when we come down to the shoot and all of a sudden we're working on it, we're getting it, we're getting it, and the AD says lunch. And I say, geez, you know, if I could just get one more. And then in the back you hear the third electric go, because he's a union guy. Give it to him. You just got the shot. You just got the movie. Okay. So you direct in a 360-degree circle. Unfortunately, most of the people I meet who want to be directors – just want to be the big guy on the set. They don't know that it's a selfless act of being everybody's uh, Tom, assistant. You just gave the answer. If people are out there looking for stardom, looking you know, to simply be the taker, to be the narcissist who everyone bows to, this is not a profession. If you are passionate and you love what you do and the the success is not as important as the process, and you're going to keep on going because you love the process, you've got a much better chance of succeeding. Um, the, the old acronym that success is 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration, just keep on doing it but keep being inspired, mm -hmm. is, is probably true. And, and success that, is something that happens while you're thinking of something else. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay. Yeah, everyone, I hope you're writing these things down. Um, Tom, you have, have been absolutely wonderful, and, and it's been my pleasure. My guest is writer, producer, director, Manhattan Ed executive, published author, Cue the music. and Renaissance <laughs> man, <laughs> Avidabule. Avidabule. That's my big challenge. It's Avidable when I was growing up. And then my mother was like, you know, Tom, it's actually Avitabile. Avitabile. So, Avitabile. Tom Tomaso Avitabile. Salvatore Avitabile. Go and get his book, The Eighth Day, or the latest, The Hammer of God, or just go to his website, www.tomavitabile. You could read his blogs on writing and the creative process, see his book trailers, and read along with excerpts from his novels. And you could email him there. I am Dr. Errol Gluck. Remember, to every problem, there is a solution. I am your problem solver. Please go to our website at www.glucksolutions.org or call me direct at 212-599-3195. Till next time.